Uh, thank you. So before I get into the focus on Lunar Prospector, I'd like to give some brief context uh, for a current project. Next slide. And that is uh, preparing an upcoming history for NASA's lunar rover, the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, or VIPER, which will explore the south pole of the moon in search of water ice and other potential resources. It is scheduled to land in late 2023 on a 100-day mission, looking in and around permanently shadowed regions and using a one-meter drill and spectrometers to detect and analyze different lunar soil environments. We have known that there is water ice on the moon for some time now, and the Viper mission will both teach us about the origin and distribution of water on the moon and help us determine how we can harvest the moon's resources for future human space exploration. Next slide. And in this narrative uh, thread about water on the moon, the Lunar Prospector mission is a milestone both in that history as well as the development of commercial space. Beyond some interesting highlights, like the mission's status as the first lunar mission to launch aboard a commercially developed rocket, Lockheed's Athena II, Lunar Prospector's history offers a unique case in the development of how NASA adapted a new management style in the era of faster, better, cheaper. In looking into this history, one observation made by the mission's principal investigator, Alan Binder, stood out to me. Next slide. He said, I only have to deliver data to NASA. That's just that far from being purely commercial. The next step, of course, is not waiting for NASA to pay the money up front, but to get people to invest in a mission like this and then sell the data to NASA in the normal commercial sense. Assuming that NASA would be the primary customer for buying the data in this scenario, we would also imagine that these data sets are of fundamental scientific value. But at what point does fundamental scientific data become something of commercial value? Obviously, this depends upon the specific data set itself and whether there is any likelihood of realizing a return on any investments related to it. My focus here, though, is not on economics, but on understanding the context for Lunar Prospector uh, with attention paid toward the role of data in NASA missions and how both the data sets and the lessons learned from a mission uh, can inform our future endeavors. Next slide. And so with that in mind, I'll give a brief mission overview, including its development before becoming a NASA mission, its connection to faster, better, cheaper, the lessons learned, both official and unofficial, and finally return to this question about data and specifically mapping as an end product and what implications are connected to that. Next slide. So first, the mission overview. Next slide. 63 million dollars for Lunar Prospector, total. And that includes the launch, which is just over $20 million of that total cost. Adjusting $1998 to present day, this is just over $100 million. Even that adjusted $100 million figure is still, by far, the least costly of any other Discovery class mission. Next slide. The design was straightforward. It was spin stabilized, and there was nothing particularly novel about the instrument suite that it carried. On the left, we see the spacecraft being joined to the translunar injection stage, and then final assembly at uh, Launch Complex 46 at the Cape. Launch Complex 46 had also just opened for commercial activity in 1997, four years after the Navy had begun sharing the complex with the state of Florida. And the complex was already familiar to Lockheed Missiles in Space, the prime contractor for Lunar Prospector, since it had been used for land-based tests of Lockheed's Trident ballistic missile. Next slide. And at 9.28 p.m. local time on January 6, 1998, Lunar Prospector successfully launched and later began its moon mapping mission. Uh, that instrument suite that I mentioned, next slide, included a gamma ray spectrometer to measure elemental abundances on the lunar surface. Uh, the alpha particle spectrometer detected radon outgassing events and was intended to look for tectonic activity. The electron reflectometer in conjunction with the magnetometer located and measured the strength of weak localized magnetic fields, and the neutron spectrometer pictured here was the key instrument that detected signatures of what could be water ice. Note that there were no cameras on board. Next slide. But no cameras does not mean that there wasn't compelling imagery that resulted. The imagery was in the form of maps that were constructed from the data. Next slide. And here is perhaps the most compelling set of maps that resulted. 
we're looking at the north and south poles of the moon and the dark and blue purple and, and the dark blue and purple regions indicate neutron emissions that are consistent with hydrogen rich deposits those signatures are the possible indications of water ice or hydrated minerals next slide And that made the cover of science in the September 1998 issue that was devoted to the mission. The suggestion of water ice was strong enough for NASA and the team to make claims in the media that water ice had indeed been found. Next slide. So this rehashes the main highlights at the end of its mission. Lunar Prospector was intentionally impacted into the moon to see if ground and space-based observations of the resulting plume could provide more definitive evidence for water. It did not. And this set the stage for the subsequent LCROSS mission in 2009 that did fly through and directly measure the plume kept picked up by an impactor at the South Pole. And while that provided the most definitive evidence for water up to that point, it still leaves open the outstanding question about how water ice is distributed in the polar regions. Viper will begin to answer that question. Returning to Lunar Prospector, next slide. Uh, it, it's, uh, it was developed independent of NASA by Binder and his colleague Preston Carter, both of whom were Lockheed contractors at JSC in the late 1980s. Next slide. And they began by seeking volunteers. This announcement appeared in an August 1989 edition of the JSC newsletter Roundup, where the plan uh, was to see if a team of engineers who were willing to work in their spare time on the mission could be assembled. Binder created a corporation to be able to enter into contracts and initially worked with the Space Studies Institute, but that partnership did not last. Corporate sponsorship was considered. At one point, Binder and Carter met with representatives from Pepsi to see if the soft drink company would, uh, could fund the mission in exchange for branding on the spacecraft and its rocket. There was even an overture from NPO Energia, but that initial Soviet offer to supply the launch did not develop very far. Next slide. In that same August 1989 issue of Roundup was this article on planning for a lunar outpost. This was already a year after the return to flight after the loss of Challenger and newly elected George H.W. Bush's proposal to return to the moon. And this sort of grand NASA planning uh, and time not spent executing a, miss a mission like Lunar Prospector, uh, time that Binder also increasingly uh, grew to feel was being wasted within the bureaucracy contributed to his disillusionment with NASA, which eventually became outright resentment. Years after the successful conclusion of the mission, he did publish a book detailing all of his grievances. Those grievances were so numerous, there isn't time to get into all of them, uh, but there will be some indication of the related themes involved uh, when considering the lessons learned. Uh, and to get to lessons learned a bit sooner, I'll go through this next section um, a bit quickly. Next slide. And that is Lunar Prospector's connection to faster, better, cheaper. Next slide. After Near and Pathfinder, Lunar Prospector was the third mission in the Discovery program and the first of those to be competitively selected. Discovery was promoted as part of Faster, Better, Cheaper, but Faster, Better, Cheaper did not originate within NASA. Next slide. Faster, Better, Cheaper developed among White House space policy staff as a way to reduce costs for the Strategic Defense Initiative. Leaders of SDI proposed Clementine, and this satellite launched in 1994, four years before Lunar Prospector, and after just 22 months of development at a cost of $80 million, including the launch, completed a detailed mapping of the moon. On the left, we see the South Pole and the radar signature Clementine detected that hinted at water ice although the evidence was not as compelling as what Lunar Prospector would gather. But that discovery uh, hadn't been the point. Next slide. Clementine was very much a demonstration that the reduced emphasis on formal systems management in favor of greater reliance on teamwork could pick up some of the slack for controlling risk, uh, while more risk was tolerated and costs further reduced through shortened timelines and producing small spacecraft with reduced capability. It was the antithesis in many ways to how NASA was functioning. And while that sort of anti-NASA ethos aligned with Binder's motivation to originally pursue Lunar Prospector as a private mission, relying on donated time, a hoped for donated launch, and even flirting with corporate branding as a source of funding, it all was just too much of a radical departure at the time to materialize. Binder had left Lockheed and was actually rehired by them in his capacity as the Lunar Prospector PI once it was clear that the mission had to rely on NASA funding 
and use a known and proven prime contractor. Next slide. And that was one of the first lessons learned from the mission. Next slide. These are the five categories that NASA's program management for Lunar Prospector identified. Next slide. And that reliance on a single prime contractor was part of the lessons learned that NASA mission management reported. When discussing lean structure and finding the right balance of how to apply government oversight, inadvertently subverting the contractor's project responsibility through micromanagement was the somewhat blunt phrasing for a concern that appeared in draft versions of a paper that would ultimately be published in AIAA. But the main takeaways from the drafts to the final versions were the same. Another passing mention that faster, better, cheaper had the potential to be misinterpreted uh, was also struck from the final draft. But again, the overall lessons remained the same. Next slide. Since Lockheed was literally across the runway at Moffett Field from the NASA program office at Ames, this proximity was touted as a benefit, although it is not generally recognized as a necessity for faster, better, cheaper. Next slide. Binder had championed Lunar Prospector for over a decade. He obviously did not have his own personal wealth to throw at the mission as some billionaires today have been at liberty to do. But he did possess a single-minded determination and a difficulty with compromise that is somewhat similar. The mission could not have succeeded without the team, but without Binder, it is doubtful Lunar Prospector would have uh, ever happened. Next slide. Uh, these points about design maturity, and next slide. Uh, mission complexity are consequences of the stability of the mission concept. And at the end of the day, Binder delivered the data that the mission was designed to gather. And with that in mind, it's worth revisiting his quote from earlier. Next slide. After finally succeeding in getting Lunar Prospector funded and operational, Binder speaks of investment. Any naivete from eight years prior when he was hoping to get a launch for free and rely on a team of volunteers is seemingly gone. But unanswered is the question about who these people are that would invest in such a fundamentally scientific mission. If not NASA, then who? Commercial private imaging satellite firms had already begun emerging in the 1990s, but the imagery would be squarely focused on Earth, not looking out to space, and certainly not on fundamental scientific knowledge of no immediate monetary value. Where's the commercial sense in that? Next slide. And so to wrap up, next slide. We've seen this data that has hinted at water ice uh, on the moon from Clementine, Lunar Prospector, and more recently, NASA's moon mineralogy mapper instrument aboard the Indian spacecraft Chandrayaan-1. The context that these data sets come out of, next slide, are not strictly within these categories. Obviously, there is some overlap in the exchange of people on teams over time can make these boundaries somewhat coarse, although the boundaries remain much more clearly defined legally. I wouldn't presume to explain how commercial space maps onto these categories, so in place of that, I'd like to offer an analogy for thinking about future mapping of the moon. Next slide. So the blue areas, again, indicate the signature of water and hydroxyl molecules. I can't help but see a map such as this, a further refinement of the Clementine and Lunar Prospector maps, and not think of, next slide, something like this. This is the 1891 preliminary mineralogical and geological map of the state of California, which was prepared and published by the California State Mining Bureau. Beginning with this map, the responsibility for preparing and publishing succeeding editions of these large-scale geologic maps of California has remained with the state. Prior to that, a similar undertaking had been completed under the auspices of the War Department shortly after California statehood. In this 1891 map, special emphasis is given to mineral resources, not surprisingly, the regions of gravel and slate known to contain gold. In drawing this comparison to the moon, it's clear that coordinated and sophisticated mapping of the moon is preceding any extraction of resources, rather than occurring decades after it was already underway, as in the case of the gold rush. While missions like Clementine and Lunar Prospector and others have created global maps of the moon, Viper will provide a localized but very detailed look that will suggest what the next global map of the moon's resources could look like. Will NASA fund that next global resource um, uh, map of the moon, 
or will NASA one day purchase resources for exploration from a company that did that further mapping and then provides access to a resource like lunar water to NASA? Who knows? I think the case of Landsat is really instructive here, as Brian Giroux detailed in the first session today, especially with respect to this question about non-discriminatory data access policies and whether in practice the data ends up as a public good or really more of a private commodity. The immediate commercial component to Viper, though, is its status as Eclipse mission that is buying a service, namely the launch and delivery to the moon, sort of like a space rideshare like Uber or Lyft. To wrap this up with one more connection to Lunar Prospector's history, I think Alan Binder's initial belief that donations could fund a lunar mission are much more possible today. The, crowdsour the crowdsourcing platforms exist, and beyond donations for purely scientific missions, the possibility of having many small investors fund a mission for profit could change the current landscape of commercial space, however we define commercial space. 